Yeah. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Good morning, everyone. There's a few people out in the foyer, so if you take your seats, I'm just going to grab my Bible that I've misplaced. I'll just... I'll use my phone. I thought I'd be good this week and bring a hard copy. Um, in Matthew chapter 16, for anyone who's got those... Um, uh, I've got your Bibles with you. And this is a verse that um, uh, Matt Levitt is speaking on in our sermon. Uh, and it's when Jesus asks his disciples uh, who you say I am. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump to verse 13 of Matthew 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then uh, these next few verses, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven uh how yeah we're going to praise that wonderful god to that end as well so let's stand <coughs> and i'll just say a quick prayer Lord, as we come to praise you, uh, that those scriptures, those words in our, in our hearts and minds would affect how we praise you this morning and to give you praise for the wonderful, amazing God that you are.
Father, I thank you that we can sing that truth this morning, that you have and you are the power. That, Lord, we can praise you in moments that seem impossible. We can praise you in moments when it's all going amazingly well. Father, you are the power. You are that resurrection that we can sing about and we can remember today. We just want to give you glory for that this morning. Amen. I'm going to go into family communions, just giving a little nod to Kerry so she knows not to jump up. Um, and <coughs> and as family communion, we're going to just bring up, I don't know if you can bring up the chorus, Benji, or Malk, from the first song, Your Name is Power. And it says, your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty, it won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power. And look at that. Thank you very much. And it would be lovely this morning as we sit around in families, as we you want to gather, find somebody around you to take communion with. But we want to just pray into this. So for yourself, that it may be that you just want to praise God this morning, that he's faithful. You might want to just remind yourself that he is mighty. Um, you might want to just remind yourself of the power. Power of the resurrection, you know, I could spend hours talking into that, about what it means for Jesus to be raised from the dead. And that power from God is the thing that did that. It's not normal that people raise from the dead. Just in case you were thinking that's a normal practice, it isn't. And there's an amazing power that we see in Jesus. So I'm just going to give us a minute, a moment, um, following on from that last song. Um, just to just be quiet, sit in silence, where as much as possible. And then I'm going to pray. Um, I'm going to ask... Matt, if he would mind just helping me pass around the elements, um, and then we will take that together as families. So just where you are, turn around, pray, um, and then we'll move through. So a minute silence.
Father, I'm taken aback by the power that was demonstrated on that day. Power that changed the sky, that brought darkness. Power that took someone who was human and dealt with our sins. Power that made us clean again. Power that changed a system that had been worked for thousands upon thousands of years and replaced it in one moment. Power to see lives changed. A centurion's looking at Jesus and going, surely this is the Son of God. Power to change lives from one place to another. So Lord, as you changed the skies and tore the veil for this relationship that we have with you now, Lord, you demonstrated power. And Lord, that power wasn't just on that one day on the cross. That power was shown in thunderous glory three days later when you walked with the women in, in the garden. And Father, as we think about that power, as we visualize what that looked like, those moments in the story of the cross. Lord, we see that power today. Our relationship with you, our conversion story is part of that power. And this morning as we take the bread and the wine or the juice, Lord, remind us again how that power works today. That power is not dead. That power is not gone. That power is here. To Father, help us today to see you, to see you in your mighty works. Father, we pray for mercy. We pray for freedom for the captives. Lord, as we take this gift this morning, we take this moment, we know there are so many around the world that are sitting in captivity. And Lord, as we share this act with them, we pray there's release for the captives. As we pray for the physical release, Lord, we also pray for the mental release for those that are bound in so many different ways. That the power of the cross is still alive and well. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to share around. Please do gather, pray together.
Um, I'm going to have to be a bit brave. <laughs> I don't mind being at the front here, but um, I'm going to have to be a bit brave because the word power has come through to me quite strongly this morning. Hello. Some of you may know um, or that I haven't been around very much the last few months, really, um, because I keep getting ill. And uh, I, we don't quite know what's going on, but things just aren't right. So it's just come to me this morning that I'm going to have to be brave and actually ask that maybe a few people could pray that the power of Jesus would be present um, in terms of my health at the moment and what, what's going on. Um, and whilst perhaps one or two people are doing that. Maybe there's other people here who also feel that they need prayer for something. So I'd just um, suggest that maybe you are brave and turn to someone next to you, someone that you perhaps know or trust, and just ask them as well to pray for you in whatever circumstance you're in. So maybe we can just do that for a few minutes. Let's do that. things that are said and the things that aren't said. Thank you that you are a God of power. Thank you that you are a God who can transform and change your situation that what either we're in or someone else is in. And I just pray that you will give people here, if they're struggling with things that they, they feel un overwhelmed by, just in a real difficult situation, I just pray that you can lift them out of the pit of difficulty that they are in. Thank you for Anna's honesty, Lord. We acknowledge before you we all struggle with different things. But thank you that you're a God who loves us and cares for us mm -hmm. and is interested in us and who can do mighty things, both in our lives and the people's lives and our family lives too. So we leave each one and other in your care, knowing your love and your concern for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Matt. So we've got notices. Matt. It's getting up. Uh, Have we got, is, that, is that all right? Okay, okay just checking. So we are going to, Kerry's going to come and do notices, but I'll do my notice if it's all right, Kerry, as you come up. That's all right, just checking permission. Um, so as you would have found out or heard, the church has just employed somebody else. Because I've left, I'm leaving, and this new person is taking over. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just... I, I, no, not really. Um, we have the joy that Esther Allard is joining the team. I, we've got a team of church now. So Esther's going to work for us as admin a couple of days a week. So that's really exciting and loving that. Um, do pray for the advert. I know Chris Ryle put something in the sharing live group because it's gone out to a few different places, but we've had nothing back. So please do continue to pray for that, that actually somebody, the right person for us at New Life Church will come and fulfill that position. And then the second bit, which Matt, um, it got put, Kerry did a wonderful job, thank you Kerry, of putting out a very long message from Sam and Pam. Um, we are aware as church is changing, as people are joining us, uh, we want to explain how some of our giving goes. A, a long time ago, it feels like now, about five, six years ago, we looked at a church of who are people that we want to support, um, whether that's through prayer, whether that's through financial giving, some of that were missionaries that were known to us or friends that had been passed on family members. So we started supporting Sam and Pam and the Mackies over a, 
overseas. I can't, where I'm online, I can't say exactly where, can I? No. Um, so we started supporting them, and one, twice a year we give to these families and just support the ministry. Um, Kerry, in sending out the rather long message, has updated you all with what's going on with Sam and Pam. Um, and that's with sadness in our hearts, that's where they're at. Um, but to share as a family, we had a really nice time praying with them over in Sizewell, um, and just to sit with them, stand with them, you know, because they are in a difficult place at the moment. And to say broken, I don't think it's an underestimation. You know, they are in a hard place where they know what God's asked them to do, but they cannot do it. So we as a church, we've shared that we're going to give um, what we had collected for them as a love fund gift to support them and whatever's next. But for this month, where we're going to pass on our gifts and we pass it on to Malcolm, we're just going to be giving to the Mackies. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing for the time going forward. So when we have our missionaries gift month, it will just be going to the Mackies and not Sam and Pam as it stands. If you've got any questions about that or how or why we give to these different places, please do grab me or Matt and I will explain. Kerry. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just welcome everybody. Nice to see the church has filled up. We're sat here at the beginning it looked a bit empty but people have been drifting in so lovely to see you all thank you matt levitt for coming as well we'll hear matt later i apologize for the series titles if you've been looking at the emails i think i may have got them muddled up on occasion so look forward to what you are speaking on because i don't know <laughs> um, um there's no prayer and praise at cloverlink this wednesday ben is away um we have year six children so i'm sure he'll appreciate prayer for that. We are, however, doing a prayer walk and litter pick on Friday from Cloverlink at 10 o'clock. So if anybody wants to join us on Friday at 10 o'clock. As you've heard, we're, our special collection this month is for the Mackey family. And just a reminder for your diaries, there's no service here on July the 17th. We are invited to join the Baptist Church. Thank you. So well done, guys. Got a yeah. Not, not Jude's got a birthday. There is a birthday. Ah. Oh. We do people's 50th. What? We do people's 50th. Jude's 50th. Jude's not 50th. All right. So we've got one of our older ones coming up this morning. <laughs> Young Grace. So this is for you, Grace. You. Happy birthday yeah. for. Oh, let me get this. What day is it? Friday. And what are you going to do on Friday? Um, well, on Sunday I'm having a family barbecue, but I'm at college on Friday. Lovely. What's your sister doing on Friday? She's got a PD day. Oh. <laughs> her sister's got a day off on her birthday. How hard, eh? So Grace will still be at college studying hard. And how old are you going to be, Grace, for anyone who doesn't know? 17. 17. And I remember when Grace was born. So she's really grown up in the church. It's so fantastic having her still here. And we just want to pray for her and bless her over this next year. So let's pray. Father God, we just bring grace before you. And we thank you so much for the way you have been with her throughout her life so far. We thank you that you've kept her close to you. And we thank you that she still wants to seek you and she wants to serve you in her life. And we pray, Father, for this year going forward, we ask, Lord, that she will really meet with you, that she will sense you in a way she hasn't done before, that she'll get renewed energy to understand who you are and what you want to do for her. And I thank you so much, Lord, that you love her and made her just the way she is and you made her perfect and that you love her so much you'd even rejoice over her with singing as it says in Zephaniah and father I pray that she will know that this year that she will know your love and that she will really want to find out more about you and keep close to you amen thank you and the kids can now go out as well so that you'll jump up and run out just as you do, I also pray for them, but yeah, keep going. God, we thank you for our young people, and a real blessing it is to have them in the church. And I just ask for them and for us as we get taught and, and listen and receive from you, that you'd bless that time to us. Help us to take on these things to heart. Amen. And one last thing, I will we'll play a song. I think I feel quite convicted to play this one and sing it. Um, it's... It's these things when you've got, sometimes God doesn't heal. That's, that's really difficult. And as well, as well, even persecuted Christians around the world, all of us, all Christians, have this hope in our hearts that nothing can touch, nothing of Satan, nothing of the world can touch the hope that we have. And no matter what the circumstance is, 
whilst extremely difficult at times and really gut-wrenching, we can still praise God and receive that peace and joy that comes only from him. Let's stand and sing this song.
pray for Matt before he preaches too. Thank you, Lord, for the time that Matt has spent preparing for this morning, the way that you've guided him and led him with your Holy Spirit in him. And pray that this morning's uh, uh, teaching that he has to bring to us would really stir us up in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, ben saying he's going to help with the Year 6 residential next week. Um, two weeks ago, I had to go and help with a Year 5 residential. Now, I- I'm not very good with children. I- I'm a youth worker, really. And uh, there was this kid. Uh, I had to go and knock on all the cabin doors and get them to come out ready for their first activity. And this, uh, I knocked on this cabin door, and this boy said, yes. So I opened the door. And before I could say anything, he held up his hand like this, and he went, I have no interest in learning how to climb a net. I've got far more important things to do. And he reached into his bag, and he pulled out a copy of Railway Modeler magazine, and he sat on his bed and started reading Railway Modeler. Uh, So I went, all right, dude, I'll see you at lunch, and just shut the door. (laughs) So so that's what Ben's got in store for him. Anyway, uh, so uh, if you don't know me, my name's Matt. Um, I live in Stowe Market. I work in and around the Anglican Church there. But I I love coming to share with you. I love being a part of you here. So thank you for having me. Um, As we start, I'm going to ask you a question, okay? But if you are a visitor this morning, or if you're watching online, or if you're watching over somebody else's shoulder online, you get a free pass on this question, okay? So if you're a visitor this morning, you can fold your arms, you can look smug, and you can sit back, okay? And uh, now I'm looking around, see anyone who's got... No, no, that's right. Yeah, you get a free pass, okay? You can just sit back. Um, But you may still want to listen to the question. Because the question is this. What does it cost you to be a Christian? I mean, when you look back over your life, what does it actually cost you? What decisions have you made? What life choices have you made? What ethical stand have you made that has cost you because you're a Christian? Now, you might want to spend the rest of the service just thinking about that, and that's fine. Or you may want to listen on. Because you're in this series called the Jesus Sessions, and I know you sort of dipped in and out of these over the past eight or nine months. Uh, But I watched the first one that Ben did on this, and he challenged you that through this series, you're going to be building up a picture of who Jesus is. Uh, Not perhaps who we might think he is, but who the Bible declares him to be. Layer upon layer, like a fine art picture in a gallery. Layer upon layer upon layer. Building up this full description of who Jesus is and what he came to do. And so I'm a part of that. And we're looking at Jesus the Saviour. And I want to read to you this morning. I did exactly what they told me not to do, which was press it about three times. Here we go. From Matthew chapter 16, if you've got your Bibles and want to follow, you may want to. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist Others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and by blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, uh, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he orders his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. 
And from that day, that, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. You see, Jesus is here and he's walking with his disciples and they enter this region called Caesarea Philippi. And other versions of the story um, uh, say that actually they stop to pray at this point. And this region of Caesarea Philippi is quite an interesting place. It's about 15 or 20 miles northwest of the Sea of Galilee. And it's named for Philip, who was the son of Herod the Great. And later, Caesar was added to it to sort of give authority to the Roman Empire. Thus you get Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi was this rocky place. As you entered it, it was a bit of a valley with huge sort of rock, rock cliffs around you. But there was a waterfall that happened there. And it became a place to kind of stop and recuperate on your way northward. Almost a kind of oasis in the middle of the wilderness region. And because there's all these rocks and everything around, there's lots of crevices and cracks and tiny caves. And over time, the people of the region, or perhaps visitors, had started putting icons or statues or little shrines into these cracks in the crevices. Icons to different gods. And probably most... Uh, importantly, the god Pan, but lots of gods. There were icons and statues all around. And this place had become a kind of unofficial, we worship any god here sort of place. And, it, and you, can, you can imagine these high rock cliffs with these statues and everything in it. The cold water flowing down from the, from the waterfall. You know, this sort of pagan power and actually, it began to be transferred to sort of a political power. It was a royal resort. They stopped on the way down to Jerusalem here. A really interesting place to stop and to sit and to contemplate authority and gods and power. Interestingly, as, as we've heard read, and it's not really what I want to be talking about this morning, but in this passage... Jesus likens the foundations of the church to this place. He's talking about Peter, the rock, but he's also sitting on a rock. <laughs> the church is going to be like this place. In one way, this rock, this solid foundation, but also like a river, a mission, a movement, a, a powerful life-giving thing. This sort of... Yeah, this dual aspect of this place is reflected in the church. But anyway, Jesus is surrounded by all of this as he says to his disciples, who do the crowds say the Son of Man is? Who do the crowds say I am? And in a way, that's an easy question to answer. I mean, we could do it today without much trouble. I could put an Instagram post or a, a TikTok video out there. You know, who do you think Jesus is? And, and ping, the answers would come flooding back. Who does the world say Jesus is? Well, some people might say he's a good man. Some people might say he's a great teacher. Um, some people might say he's a holy man like Elijah or, or Moses or one of the great heroes of old. You know, the, the answers would be fairly similar, actually, to 2,000 years ago. This is what the world might say he is. A good man, a holy figure. Even here in Suffolk, that's probably the kind of answer you'd get. This all-encompassing, but very non-committal kind of answer. But then Jesus turns, doesn't he? But what about you? Who do you say I am? You can imagine him rising from sitting down. And, what about you? I mean, it doesn't say this, but just imagine him walking forward and turning his steely-eyed gaze. What about you? It becomes a bit more personal then, doesn't it? 
you begin to shuffle backwards in your seats. Because imagine him. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus turns his gaze on you and says, what about you? Who do you say I am? It becomes much more personal now. Perhaps more intimate. Perhaps more, more uncomfortable. Imagine asking that in your coffee time at the office tomorrow. <laughs> we could have the all-encompassing discussion about the world. <laughs> but what about you? You see, surrounded by these icons and statues to other gods, Jesus wants them to get personal. Because it's easy to sit with the crowd. It's easy to go along with what everyone else says and for Jesus to be one of 101 other statues. He's easy to hold at a distance. He's easy to not really commit to. And it's at this point that Peter almost, because he's got this laser eye gaze of Jesus on him, Peter blurts out, well, you're the Messiah. It's like the first time this has been voiced. And we're going to pause just for a moment in our talk. Um, Because this is where we begin to link into our theme of Jesus' saviour. You see, Messiah is this Hebrew word, Masiak, which literally means anointed one. And in the New Testament Koine Greek, we translate it Christ, really. Christ isn't Jesus' surname. It's not Jesus Christ. It's Jesus, and then a title, Christ. And it means roughly the same thing, anointed one. This anointing was recognising God's hand of calling on someone and asking for God's blessing on them. They're set out for a task. Interestingly, the reason uh, reason they used to anoint with oil was it actually came from the shepherds. The shepherds used to cover their sheep with olive oil because it meant all the ticks and the insects couldn't hold on and sort of fall off and it was like a barrier a protection so we anointed in the bible they anointed people for a task with olive oil to signify god's protection over them to mark them out for a task to show the seriousness of the role that they're about to enter into and kings were anointed and priests were anointed prophets were anointed And this carried on right the way through the Bible, actually. Many of the characters we've known and heard of were anointed to a task. Some of them lived up to that anointing, and some of them didn't do quite so well. But they were anointed and set apart for this task. So in its simplest form, Peter is saying, you're the Messiah, it, it, it kind of, in its simplest form, you're, you're the one set out for a task. But actually, the word Messiah meant so much more than that to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel. In fact, it was more than a word. It was an idea. It was a theme. It was a narrative. It was a dream. It was a hope. You see, almost from their existence, the nation of Israel have been talking about a liberator. Someone who will come in and set them free. Someone who will save them. You know, from from the beginning, from the Hebrew slaves in, in Pharaoh's Egypt, to becoming captives in Babylon during the exile, to the occupation of their lands by the Romans, this dream, this hope, this... Belief is growing and growing and growing and the narrative surrounding it is becoming more and more and more. It's a whispered dream of a captive people. Hold on. Hang in there. God hasn't forgotten us. He will send a Messiah. He will send an anointed one. He will send a liberator. He will send a rescuer. He will send someone to overthrow and set free. And at times in their history, they'd really seen this begin to come to light. And each time they did, something more was added to the story, to the narrative of Messiah. 
you know, between the Testaments, between Old Testament and New Testament, things were still happening. A man called Judas Maccabee rose up as a Messiah, small m, to, to break the bondage of Antiochus and to, to cleanse the temple. And, that, and actually they broke into the temple and cleansed it, wiping some horrible stuff that had been done in the temple, and wiping it away with palm fronds, which is where the idea of palm fronds connecting to Messiah began to be, you know, and we know the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem and palm fronds were thrown down because now it's the symbol of the Messiah. You see, the story gets bigger and bigger. Even at the Easter story, the calling of Barabbas, could he be another Judas Maccabee? Could he be another liberator who will set us free? Will he overthrow the Romans by force? Do you see this idea of Messiah becomes more than just a word. It becomes a hope and a dream. In fact, it sat at the heart of what it meant to be an oppressed Jew in an oppressed Jewish nation. You whispered it in, in dark corners. You told your children it as a bedtime story. Don't worry, child, one day it'll be different. So when Peter said, you're the Messiah, all the other disciples, their eyes were opened and this flood of information came into their brain. This childhood story suddenly came to life. The hope and the longing sort of became real. It's like listening to stories of King Arthur and then one day you discover a sword in a stone. And you go, wow, could it be true? You can then see why their desire to rush off half-cocked and tell the world, hey, Jesus is the Messiah. You, you can see why Jesus said, well, hold on. Don't tell anyone else because I've got to explain to you what the Messiah really has come to do. And actually, Jesus really did try. You know, he told them that the Son of Man had to suffer. He told them that he had to die. He told them that in three days he has to rise again. The trouble is, the disciples didn't really listen because they've got this backlog of story going on in their mind. Now, of course, anointed one, Christ, Messiah, they mean the same thing. And, but Jesus, at this point, sort of adds something else to it. He adds saviour. When he begins to explain what the Messiah really is, he adds saviour into this corporate memory of messiahship. It's more than a physical liberation from an occupying force. Jesus lays on this divine purpose. Yes, I'm the Messiah, but, but I'm more than an earthly Messiah. You see, Jesus needed his disciples to understand that Liberation wasn't just from earthly bondage, you know, being a slave. It was liberation from bondage to sin. It was liberation from having to try and try and try and never succeed. It was liberation to that repetition of trial and error and trial and error and sin and sacrifice and sin and sacrifice that the old covenant demanded. So he's forcing them to come face to face with, who do you say I am? And actually, that claim that he was not just an earthly Messiah, but a heavenly Messiah, actually was a claim which triggered cries of blasphemy from all those around. Anyone who heard him say, you got the power to forgive sins? Well, just a few verses there for you. Jesus said, I am the Father, I and the Father are one. And the moment he says this, his Jewish opponents pick up stones to stone him. Well, what you're saying is blasphemy. And he says, Before Abraham was born, I am. Immediately claiming to be the great I am. And on this occasion too, they tried to stone him. Because Jesus has linked earthly messiahship to heavenly messiahship and brought them together in himself. Way, way, way back, okay? Way back when I left school, my first job, my first real proper paid job, 
um, was as a lifeguard. I worked at a leisure centre, I worked full time um, I, I, as a lifeguard in Chalfont St Peter Le Leisure Centre in, surprisingly, Chalfont St Peter. And um, uh, uh, I had visions of Baywatch in my mind. For those of you that know Baywatch, I convinced my mum that, of course, I could watch this because it's training. It wasn't really. It was about beautiful women in Australia in red swimsuits. But, but I, I, you know, I had visions of one day being a lifeguard on Bondi Beach in Australia. I once went to Bondi Beach, actually, and it was very funny because I met this Australian there, and he went, look, mate, he said it in an Australian accent. I can't do it. But he said, mate, the uh, Bondi Beach isn't even the nicest beach in Sydney. Let, let alone Australia, let alone the world. Anyway, so I, I, I had visions of what it meant to be a lifeguard, diving in, saving people's life, all of this. Anyway, one night after a late night shift, I came back and I plonked myself in front of the TV, turned it on, and there was some documentary about a disaster, a flood that was happening. And this flood was overwhelming the village, and there was this little girl floating down the river. And you watched all the villagers trying to save her. And they're screaming and they're shouting. And then you just see this man from the back of the village just run through the crowd and dive in. And he grabs this girl and he holds her up. But the current's too strong. And they're both swept away down the river. But, but he's holding her head above the water until they later hit this branch and they were both saved. And I remember, I can clearly remember sitting there on my sofa as a lifeguard thinking that guy did everything wrong. You're not meant to dive in, you're meant to call for help, you're meant to get the nets, you're meant to get the rope, you're meant to get the pole, knowing that he did everything wrong but at the same time understanding that he did everything right. Because there are times as a lifeguard where you just have to commit. And you have to dive in. And you have to submit yourself to the risk of diving in because you want to save that person. You want to fully immerse yourself in it. And what I've just described to you is the biblical doctrine of the incarnation. This long, poncy word, which just means God, <laughs> reaching out from afar, rather than just leaning in with a pole, or leaning in with the net, or shouting for help, he dives in. Actually, and we don't hear many sermons about this, but submitting himself as God to the risks of becoming human. He fully immersed himself in humanity, becoming a saviour, one who saves, to hold humanity's head above the water. And anyone who comes to Jesus, anyone who clings on to Jesus for dear life, anyone who holds on to him while the waters are raging around, will receive salvation. They'll be saved. This word saviour refers to the work that he is going to do on the cross. Jesus, one who saves. The incarnate God who became man in all the risks that that involved to then save us. There's a reading you might know of in the beginning of the book of Colossians where it describes Jesus as ruling and reigning with majestic power over all creation with his desire to reconcile, that means to bring back all of creation into good relationship with God. And that means you and me. That's why we need a saviour. His desire is to bring us back and hold us before God without blemish, the Bible says. He is our saviour. And just so you know, if I was preaching in Latin America or Africa, you'd be whooping and cheering right now. <laughs> That's what he came to do. Now, once we understand that, his following demands become easier to understand. Note I say easier to understand, not easier to do, but easier to understand. 
Because Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, that means whoever wants to follow me, whoever wants to learn from me, whoever wants to live like me, whoever wants to be saved by me, must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their own life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And he begins to describe what it looks like to follow him. And I guess this is where our application starts. Does this following of Jesus match your life? Does it match my life? If you're one of those people who's, who's sitting back just watching online at the moment, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to follow God. This is what it means to have Jesus as our saviour. And, and he lists out three commands, really. They're not suggestions. They're not, well, if you want to or not. Firstly, he says, oh, that was the passage that I was going to read to you, but didn't. First, he says, you must deny yourself. In, 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 in Greek, the original language this was written in, deny meant to refuse to associate with. <laughs> you must refuse to associate with yourself. <laughs> That's what he's saying. You must no longer associate with the, yourself with the person you are, the person you once were, the person that says, me first, the person whose selfishness rules, the person who says, my wants are most important. You've got to refuse that. You've got to deny yourself. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to deny yourself. And then he says, well, then you've got to take up your cross daily. We're 2,000 years removed from crucifixion. Imagine what it means when you, if you live in a land of crucifixion and you hear, oh, take up your cross daily. I mean, the moment you pick up your cross in New Testament um, Palestine, you pick up your cross, it means your life is over. It means you're dead man walking, really. It means you, you've got your cross on your back and you're walking to your site of crucifixion. Jesus actually had to do it. And Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, your life, as you understand it, is over. Your rights are over. Picking up your cross isn't all, all my knees are aching today. <laughs> it's much more fundamental than that. You can't, you can't pick your cross up on Sunday morning because it's church. And we, we've all got our cross on our back today because it's church, but Monday morning I'm putting it down because it's too tough to be a Christian at work. So I'm just putting it down. I'll pick it up again next Saturday night, ready for church. You can't do that. You know, New Testament Palestine, you couldn't put down your cross when it got a bit heavy, when it got a bit inconvenient, when it gets a bit difficult. Now Jesus says you've got to pick up your cross daily and follow him. And that's what he says, isn't it? The third, he says, you follow me. You follow me wherever it may lead you. In fact, most of the disciples had been called literally by Jesus to follow him. Leave your nets and follow me. I mean, think what that meant for them. They had to give up their family. They had to give up their future pension security. <laughs> they had to give up their now provision. That, that fishing meant they had to give up their reputations. Everyone would have thought them nuts to give up a, a good, wealthy, well-paying job like fishermen to suddenly follow this new rabbi, Jesus. And that's, that's what being a Christian is, to deny yourself, to take you across daily and to follow me. And it's interesting, actually, when you read the gospel accounts, from this moment on in the story, Jesus becomes much more resolute much more focused, literally, geographically, he turns his sights towards Jerusalem and begins to walk towards the completion of his mission. His preaching becomes more focused, more definite, more sort of certain, much more determined. So as I come to the end, I said at the beginning of this talk, what does it cost you and I to be a Christian? When you look back over your life, what does it actually cost you? What decisions, what life choices, what ethics 
uh, you know, have been influenced by your decision to follow Jesus. Now, for some of you, I said you'd got a free pass, <laughs> and you had a free pass from that question. <laughs> but you don't get a free pass from the other question of the day, which was, who do you say I am? Maybe, I'm going to avoid looking at anyone now, but maybe Jesus is turning his steely eyes on you this morning. Maybe you've been good at answering the who do the world say I am kind of question. But there comes a moment in everyone's life where he turns his gaze on you and he says, who do you say I am? And if you've been listening over the course of this series that Ben and others have been teaching on, the picture has been building up to this point. You've learned that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. You learn about Jesus as teacher, and Jesus as life itself, and Jesus bringing justice and love, Jesus as healer, leading to this point of Jesus as saviour. And maybe this is a moment to pause and think, who do I say he is? Now, there's two weeks to go in the series. I'm not quite sure when you're going to be doing them, but two weeks to go where Jesus, the risen one, in effect offers proof to all that he has done and said in the past. I mean, if Jesus wasn't raised, then this is worthless. <laughs> he, in fact, he is just a good man that the world says he is, if he's not been saved. And then following that, Jesus, the returning one. Because one day he will come back, not as an incarnate, frail baby, but as Lord and King of all creation. So I leave it there. Who do you say I am? I say he's Jesus Christ, Messiah, anointed one, and Saviour. So, I picked some songs, and these two, we'll start with Rock of Ages, who I might say, personally, when I read that scripture, things that I would say God is. And I know it's a bit of a loose connection, because he says, I'll build my church on you, Peter, as a, and mentioning rock. And I'm just, you know, this old hymn for me describes how God has been in my life I'm sure it does for many others too let's stand together
So extremely challenging, something I know that I really need to take to heart and act on. And pray that you would not only convict us and challenge us, but also remind us of how 
patient, graceful, merciful and loving you are to help us through all of these times that we do these things in your strength and we build our lives on you, not on worldly things. Amen. Thank you all. Uh, tea and coffee as always.